Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans, and you join me from an undisclosed location somewhere in Western Croatia. I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by Stephen Lett's niece. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> so when you approached me, I think that's actually how you described yourself in the subjects, and I was never not going to open that email. Uh, um, but I'm right in saying that you didn't approach me lightly. It wasn't something where you were just kind of milking the fact that you have this, uh, this very powerful person in your family. There's a serious story that we're going to get into. And as I understand it, you're paying a price for going public with this story. I, yes, most likely definitely playing a very big price because all my family is still one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And do you feel that they, do you suspect that they will shun you as a result of this video and another video that we're going to talk about? Yes, I anticipate that happening. I wish it wouldn't, but that's what I anticipate. Just to establish that you are in fact Stephen Let's niece. I think we can show a photograph of you at the beach with various family and uh, Stephen is there with his wife, Susan. Yeah. And as I understand it, um, it's through Susan that you're related. So you're on, I think, Susan's side of the family. Is that right? Yes. Susan is my aunt. She is my father's sister. So that is sure. how I'm related to Steve. And for how many years have you known um, Stephen? Well, I'm 41, so <laughs> all my life. And uh, one of the questions that I asked before we get into the really serious stuff, because again, there's a serious reason why you approached me. Yeah. One of the questions I asked, or first, one of the first questions I asked was, is it, is it natural? Is that naturally the way he speaks when he's speaking in this extremely mellow, dramatic way on camera? Has he always spoken that way for, for the whole time you've known him? Only when he's speaking in public. When he's with family and friends, he's a much more normal speaking manner than he's not overly eccentric or facial expressions, but he's much more mild-mannered than that. And how would you describe his his personality, you know, based on your interactions with him? Um, he, he is, he's very serious. He's a very private person um, with himself, with his family. He's very private. Um, but, and he takes his role very seriously and always has. I, I used to um, go see them when he was in the circuit work, when him and Susan were in the circuit work and I would go visit them. I started visiting them while they were in the circuit work serving congregations about 15, when I was 15 years old. They were in, um, actually earlier than that, sorry, about 12 and they were in Long Island. Is there anything that you know about Stephen that you feel would surprise people if they if they knew him as well as you know him? Um, he's competitive. I don't know if that's a surprise or not. Um, he, I'm trying to think. It's it's one of those things to think have to think back and um, think what people may know about him and what people may not know about him. Um, he likes to play dominoes. Okay. <laughs> um, Less of a chess man, more of a dominoes man. Okay. More of a dominoes man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but that picture that you are showing that I'm in with him is actually when my husband proposed. So that was almost 21 years ago. That was kind of like a, a family occasion. And oh, yes. You know, when when there's a proposal, when there's or when there's an engagement, it's sort of expected for extended family to be involved. 
Um, has Stephen been involved in your life more or less since he became a member of the governing body? Um, I would say about the same because I visited him prior to once he was made on the governing body, like I said, visiting him while they were in the circuit work in New York. And then we he would be um, a visiting speaker at an assembly or convention and that would be close by to where we were living. And so then I would spend time with him that way. We would go after, after I have, I have two daughters. So after one of them was born, we went and visited them so they could see um, our daughter and while they were a speaker at a convention. And then we've went and visited them at New York at Bethel um, for an annual or actually not annual meeting, um, the Gilead, Gilead graduation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And that was when I was pregnant with my oldest. So she's now 12. Sure. So it sounds like, you know, you've, you've continued to be in Stephen's life. Yes. And, and Susan's life, even despite their kind of rising up the ladder as it were. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. And yeah. something that my husband and I would express to Susan and Steve, and my husband actually did more to Steve, was that um, there weren't videos appropriate for kids. This was prior to Sophia and Caleb. And it was a few years later that those started coming out. And I'm not saying that it's after my daughter, but my daughter's name is Sophie. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> one thing that kind of uh, irks me, uh, there are a number of problems that I have with your uncle. <laughs> um, one of the issues I have more than anything is his seeming fixation with young ones yes. and uh, with, with advising as to what, young people should do with their lives and advising as to how young people should be raised. Children are not born with the godly quality of love. In fact, because of imperfection, they're born with the opposite. Often a tendency to be selfish. They grab things, mine, mine, mine. Uh, this tendency toward greed becomes manifest very early. For example, as we see little toddlers grab things and hold them tightly. Mine, mine, mine. Think about it. Young children have a tendency to eat what they like regardless of its nutritional value. Most young ones would be perfectly happy eating ice cream, candy, cookies, and other sweets for all of their meals. The vast majority of the waking hours of a small child are spent playing. Play, play, and more play. Most of their life is fun and games. But later, when the child goes to school, where does he get the time to do so? He has to take it from his playtime. But now, spiritually speaking, we can ask ourselves, how far have we progressed in buying out time from our playtime? If we had time, we could have discussed other negative traits to be avoided, such as children tend to have a short attention span. They're easily distracted. Their curiosity often gets them into trouble. And they generally need a lot of time and attention they're high maintenance. He has a lot of opinions about children and about the raising of children as someone who doesn't have children. Yes. And I can't help but wonder whether his approach to um, indoctrination materials and propaganda aimed at children might be a little bit tempered if he understood more or had more interaction with children as a parent and understand and, and, and understood a little bit more about what is or isn't age appropriate. Right. No, I would agree. I agree with you. And I think that is also his interaction, even in private time with our family, 
it say normal person's reaction to that doesn't spend a lot of time around children. So nothing really negative from that standpoint, just it's, he's just not normally around children. So other than maybe interacting with them at the assemblies or conventions or meetings. And but that's again odd because he's not around children much. He doesn't have children. And furthermore, when he speaks about children, he, it becomes quite clear that he kind of doesn't like them. Uh, has that ever come across to you uh, when you've observed him interacting with children? Well, it's a very, it's a very perfunctory interaction. Mm. That's probably a better way to, it's, it's, yeah. it's an interaction of someone that is never around children and doesn't have the desire to have, be around children. I'm not sure, but his interaction is kind of perfunctory. One of the things I try and understand about governing body members, you know, when I'm studying their behavior and the things that they're saying is, you know, what has led to this person assuming this position of power? Mm -hmm. um, I'm finding that there is a bit of a pattern involved, namely mm -hmm. governing body members usually spend at least some time working in the service department where they will be exposed to some of the very worst aspects of the organization. Mm -hmm. And it seems that almost as though if they can be okay with those things, mm -hmm. uh, if they can show a certain degree of immunity uh, to the skeletons in the in the closet, as it were, they tend to rise up the ladder uh, more quickly. Um, are there any aspects of your uncle's character or personality that you feel may have assisted in his rise up the ranks? Not that I can really think of right off the top of my head. Um, I just, you know, like I said before, he is competitive. So just, I think, naturally competitive. So I think that I'm sure played a part in wanting to um, rise up high. And so he, and I think I mentioned to the, you this in an email that mm. he, he was recruited, for lack of a better word, by Brother Nor because he did not want to go to Bethel, actually. And Brother Nor told him that if he didn't have a good enough reason, he was, he needed to apply. Oh, really? Yes. So he was basically ordered to apply for Bethel by Brother Nor. Correct. Understood. He was, because Brother Nor was there visiting the family. Yeah, it's, it's just fascinating to think. Uh, and do you know much about the other side, the other side of the family? In other words, Stephen's side of the family. I know he's, he has a brother named Tim who he's been involved with real estate transactions with do you know anything about that or is that side of the family off off your radar as it were i know very little not enough to speak on with mm. accuracy i i do know that they yes they have been on real estate deals together um i know he's close with his brother um and his brother lives close to where my family part of my family lives in southern alabama so I have seen them. I've been around him. I've been. I was around his mother when she was uh, alive. So, okay. but I'm not, I've not been around them enough to give an opinion. Sure, I'm not asking for any opinions on things that you don't know anything about. I'm just. Yeah. I'm. I'm probing the depths of, <laughs> of your knowledge about a very significant person to Jehovah's Witnesses, and no. um, so with with Tim, I think it's fair. It's safe to say that he. He's either not uh, an active Jehovah's Witness or he's never been a, an active Jehovah's Witness. I'm not quite sure what the dynamic is, but I don't think he's as involved in the organization. Is that correct? I don't. I think his his involvement is very limited from mm. my understanding currently. Sure. Okay. I, he was, when I was younger, um, like a, a kid, I know he was more involved just in the congregation in general. Mm -hmm. So, I, I I do know he once was. If he isn't now, I don't know how much he would be. And you mentioned um, visiting Stephen and Susan at Bethel. Yes. Um, uh, to what extent? Because one thing that's kind of of interest to ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses mm -hmm. is, you know, how do these men live? And you obviously don't get to see that 
from watching the JW broadcasting episodes, you see sometimes some expensive looking jewelry apparently being flashed. Um, and you kind of sense that these men are living very comfortably. Um, did Stephen and Susan ever invite you into their quarters and did you ever get a sense of how they're actually living in that's actually where we stayed we stayed with sue and steve okay in their apartment with them right um was there anything kind of lavish about their apartment or was it just a normal apartment it it, it was just a normal apartment and they've always had a normal car nothing extravagant Um, i think for a long time they had a car that they were given from the circuit work so sure. they did not, they were not living a lavish life in their apartment or a car. Sure. And this would have been a, a rough around about what, what year that you. Well, that was when I went to Bethel for the Gilead graduation and we went to morning worship. Um, that was 2008. Sure. Okay. That was the last time I was visiting them in New York. So sure. before Warwick. Yeah, again, this is just helpful to, to paint a picture. I mean, we don't know what the situation is now. Right. But it's helpful for us to know that at least as of 2008, um, a governing body member who, after all, has taken a vow of poverty, mm-hmm. um, wasn't living a lavish lifestyle. I'm, I'm all about the facts here. I don't want no, to. No, I appreciate that. that. I, I do. I do know that his current yeah. apartment in Warwick has his office, um, mm-hmm. either in his apartment. It's right next door. So it's. But other than that, I don't know anything about their current apartment. Now, having gotten all of that out of the way, yeah. I, I'm sure there are many, many questions that people would want to ask the niece of Stephen Letts. But hopefully, right. I've, I've, I've gotten through at least some of the main ones. Yes. I think we need to talk about your brother. Yes. Um, And this is obviously a story that Stephen won't want people to hear, um, but it's directly relevant, especially in light of some of the comments that Stephen made um, at the 2020 Always Rejoice convention. There will be many others who will come back who will have to abandon their former way of life. I was thinking as an example a homosexual. Now this former homosexual comes back in the resurrection and he really thought and he he was taught and he came to believe that God accepted him with that lifestyle. But now he's going to learn about Jehovah's moral standards. And he's going to learn that Jehovah will not lower his standard to accommodate us. We have to come up to Jehovah's standard. Will he change? Will he adjust? It'll be up to him, but you brothers and sisters will help such ones to enjoy life eternal. All must learn to walk in Jehovah's righteous ways and willingly choose to do so. But now what if someone refuses to make the necessary changes? Well, the Watchtower commented on that. It said, after being given ample time, maybe even a hundred years, to seek God some will show that they refuse to practice righteousness. Justly, they will lose life in the new world. As we can see from Isaiah 65, verse 12, which says, And the sinner will be cursed, even though he is a hundred years of age. But we expect this will be the minority, that the majority will be delighted to make the adjustments so they can live in that wonderful new world. So, um, in your own words, uh, how would you describe that story? His convention part of the 2020 convention is actually what spurred me on to reach out to you because it was very upsetting for me. Because, so I have an eight-year younger brother. His name is Stephen as well. (laughs) So that may be a little confusing in telling this story. (laughs) But my brother, January of 2020, committed suicide um, because he was gay and had been disfellowshipped um, about nine, 10 years ago. And 
shunned or from all the family. So those words that he spoke at the convention very much upset me. <laughs> and so I can imagine. Yeah. I well, waited a couple of months before yeah. I reached out to you on that. And after that was released. Sure. Um, no, uh, uh, sincere condolences. Um, it must have been very traumatizing for you to, or well, it's traumatizing to lose any member, any close member of your family, but especially, you know, when it's someone taking their own lives and they have so much life ahead of them. Yes. Um, he, it's extremely painful. Yeah, it is. It's extraordinarily painful. And in Stephen's own, own words, he, it was a source of why what led to him killing himself so you're under no doubts that and it no was doubt. the repression of his homosexuality and the, the way he was dealt with by the religion that caused his suicide yes it was there is no doubt in my mind because he wrote a letter and that was in it so that is not me speculating not even slightly um, never ashamed of being gay at all, but the, he loved his family so much and he, he really, really enjoyed having his family and none of us were there. And for me, for a period of time, I wasn't, and I was probably, he and I were extraordinarily close. I mean, closer than a typical brother and sister. We were just very, very close. Because he was eight years younger, I helped my mom t take care of him. And, you know, so we had this bond that just was quite unbreakable, I think. And part of, you know, like I said, for a while, I, I shunned him also. I did always make sure that he was okay. I would check on him periodically um, because when he first came out as being, um, as came out gay, then he tried several times to commit suicide and he had named me his medical power of attorney. So I, you know, I, it was a very difficult time because I had to make decisions for him when he was not able to. Um, and then unfortunately it led at the time to disfellowshipping, but, and then obviously, like I said, a year ago, unfortunately he did kill himself. So, so this was January, 2020, um, yeah. to the best of my knowledge, uh, Stephen Lett recorded his comments that we're referring to, I think in the last week in April. Uh, mm -hmm. 2020 so we're talking you know a few weeks apart yes um you're convinced are you that when Stephen was describing a hypothetical resurrected gay person he had perhaps your brother in mind I think it's very possible I yes I think it's highly probable it was kind of a it came, it came from left field, didn't it? Um, yes, it did. That's why I think it's probable. <laughs> it, sure. it didn't. It didn't fit for some reason. It just didn't seem to. Yes, it came from left field. And what impact do you think that Stephen Lett's words, where he was essentially saying, you know, when someone who's resurrected gay, they'd better get rid of that side of of who they are um makes no sense in my my in my head mm. because it's to me that's appalling because they're going to be resurrected and so from their viewpoint still gay and now they're having to make this whole decision over again and it's odd that God would resurrect them with yeah, something that's that supposed to be an abomination. Yeah. Correct. That never yeah. made sense to me because I'm like, but mm. you're being, you're being resurrected and those where you're, you were being forgiven for your sins by death. 
So now you're being resurrected to be still yet sinful. That just that logic didn't make sense in my brain personally. Hmm. I I know my family felt a little differently. They felt it was positive that yay, he will be resurrected. There's that potential of him, of him being resurrected. So you're obviously sharing your story now with quite some reluctance and i understand you've made um i think it's a is it a five minute or so video uh, yes. um, that will be released on the same day as this video and there will be a link in the description if you want to go ahead and and check it out and share it far and wide please do that um but you are you releasing this video um and and sharing in this in interview as like an act of vengeance to get one over no. on your uncle no absolutely not i am like you said i am reluctant because before like you brought up i do have a great deal to lose um and my family are very dear to me also i talk with them weekly so i imagine that's about to stop <laughs> And that hurts my heart because I, it's not stopping from my end. I do not, I don't want to stop the communication or the association with my family because I care for them deeply. So if that does happen, that will be on their end, but not from mine. When Stephen died, I, that was one of the first tipping points. I was already starting to fade before Stephen died, probably a good six to nine months, maybe a year prior to that. Um, but when he died, it was like another step forward of seeing things for the way they are. Um, as we were preparing for, after Stephen did die, he left very clear instructions of what he wanted and what he did not want. And I think my family wanted it to still be a, be a part, be very religious still and be part of Jehovah's Witnesses and have his um, memorial service with a talk. And he was very clear that he did not want that. and. I wanted to honor that for him because I felt like we could do that where everyone could be happy, so to speak, and we could still honor my brother and what his wishes were at finally, hopefully we could do that for him. Um, we, we did eventually, we all came to agreement to just have a, like a receptional service um, just of gathering of his friends and family but that was one tipping point for me to, to not understand how we can't just honor a very simple request. Um, or it took a while to honor a very simple request by yeah. the sounds of things. Yeah, okay. Yes, and that just was, that disheartened me a little bit. And... I, I realized how alone I think Stephen felt and I struggled for a long time because I was part of that feeling that he felt alone because I was part of that in the beginning of shunning him and I had to deal with that guilt and responsibility. Um, it was about a year year and a half before that I started, before Stephen died, that I started really having him back in my life and or he really allowing me back in his. <laughs> um, and he came out to see us and spent time with me and Aaron and our girls. And he did actually also just a few days before he died as well. Um, but I just don't want, I don't want people to, they're going to go through that. I just want them to be able to see that there are, there, 
there are people out there that are probably going through the very same thing. And I want to see if we can find a way to have a community to support individuals that are being shunned, disfellowshipped for really whatever reason, but obviously for the gay community, because that decision that he had to make, I can't, I honestly can't imagine what that was or how to have had to make that decision. I think you mentioned as well that um, there was um, a voicemail video on on my channel that you found quite moving. Yes. um, From uh, someone who'd basically been in your sort of situation um, and who who was distraught because her brother was being shunned due to being gay. Um, And I think there there were other stories as well that made you realize that this is more than just what happened to Stephen. Yes. This is kind of happening in real time all around the world in various different families. Yes. And I, so I heard her voicemail on your channel and I just, I felt such compassion for her and I, that's what I want. I want people like her, like her brother, like her family to, to know that they're not alone. And I'm not sure quite how to develop that community yet. (laughs) I'm hoping I can figure that out here very quickly. (laughs) There needs to be support because when you lose, when you lose your entire friend and family that you grew up knowing and that's all you knew and to lose all of it, it, it just doesn't seem loving to me. Oh, definitely. Um, although whereas most of us feel very detached from the entire decision-making process, and it is a decision-making process, you have eight guys in upstate New York who sit around a table and not just decide to perpetuate these policies, which have mostly been handed down from previous generations of Watchtower leaders, Mm -hmm. but go one step further and produce highly um, manipulative video propaganda reinforcing this stuff. So I'm thinking not just the um, homophobic rant that Stephen had at the convention, but also the various videos on shunning. Mm -hmm. You know, your uncle's involved in this. Um, How does that make you feel? It bothers me because I can't, I can only speak for myself, but I know for me, it, in our family, it, what he says, you know, people, it reflects on when I was within the organization and I'm sure with my parents or my father rather, and my aunts and my grandparents, it reflects on us because when he was made a governing body member, I remember I ha- I was at a meeting and unexpectedly a brother calls on me and asks me to talk about Steve and my knowledge of his life. And, and so it, there's a, not, I don't want to say a pressure, but there is a over like an umbrella that as a family member, that you're, you know, you either agree and act a certain way and portray yourself to be a particular way. And so it's, it's upsetting that he feels that way. And so, and I no longer do. Do you worry that purely by virtue of the fact that people know you to be Stephen Lett's niece, Mm -hmm. um, that people will assume that you're okay uh, automatically your default position is to agree with everything that your uncle says and is that one of the reasons why you're now publicly distancing yourself and disavowing um, this homophobic element of the religion yes i would say that yes there is a definite association with anyone that knows me i am i 
have an uncle that's, and he is Steve Lett. There is definitely an association. It's always been that way. I would a lot of times not bring it up, but it would get around very quickly in the congregation. So if I'm visiting a congregation or um, we were at an assembly, it would, it would make its rounds very, very quickly. So I think just naturally people, since you are related, there is a natural assumption that I think you would. Uh, but you're proud of conduct, him. So to be speak, huh? Yeah. That you're perhaps proud of your uncle and in agreement with everything he says and does. Right. Yes. Yes. Is there anyone else in your family or in, might we say, Stephen's circle who you know either feels the way you do or disagrees in some way with, with, what the organization stands for, or do you feel as though you're more or less the only one? Um, I feel like right now I'm the only one. Right. Okay. Well, that's going to... my knowledge. Ease, that's going to ease the minds of um, the Watchtower lawyers who are watching this. Uh, <laughs> they can call off the witch hunt because it's just it's just you. It's um, just me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. me. <laughs> well, you, you know, you've you've shared a lot there. Um, I, it's one of the one of these situations where there's the, the so many things I could ask, uh, but hopefully I've covered the main points. Is there anything else that you kind of wanted to say, either to Stephen Lett or to any others, uh, perhaps your family members who might be watching this video? I think, first of all, that I did not make this decision lightly. This is my sole decision to do this. This is no one influencing me, no one guiding me or anything to that nature. Um, but it is a decision that's weighed very heavy on me to come out with a story because I could have very easily stayed quiet and it would have been much easier on my family and myself, but to be able to hopefully reach other people is what my intentions are, that I want them to know that they're not alone and that there are many people out there that are going through it and that we, will develop a support system. It's admirable that you're you're looking to help people. Um, you know, as someone who, you know, you've lost a lot yourself, you're still dealing, I'm sure, with many of these feelings of of loss. Yes. And yet you're you're still you're anxious to, you know, reach out and help others. And I very much admire you for doing that. And I think that's a, a major part of, of this. Um, but it is also useful to have some context yes. to this individual who claims to be one eighth of the faithful slave, the channel of communication between, you know, God and mankind. Yes. Um, this is an individual who spouts hatred towards gay people and arranges for gay people to be ostracized even though his own nephew committed suicide because of precisely these policies and that sort of treatment. And that's context that I think everyone needs to, to know about the next time he goes on this sort of rant or the next time his organization produces material that puts gay people in these impossible situations. Yeah, yes, and to somehow, in creating the policy, to be able to put that wedge between a parent and a child, and for the parent to be able to feel that it's okay because they are doing what they think is correct and loving. That is, that, that is hurtful because I have children and I don't think I could have, I don't think I can do that. Well, it's impossible when you've actually had children yes. uh, to imagine ever wanting to uh, treat them as though they're dead. 
yes. um, purely over an ideological difference or because they don't quite have your sexuality. Um, right, that they're a non-person. Yeah. It, it, but this it, is, again, policies that your uncle is instrumental in not yes. just perpetuating, but quite enthusiastically promoting. Yes, and it's very upsetting and and it's hurtful. Okay. Because we see where it can lead. And Stephen knows where it can lead. Yes, he has first hand knowledge. Yeah. Yes, he does. Well, all all that remains, uh, Brandy, is to thank you sincerely for sharing this. I think you're extremely brave. Um, I've been through the situation of speaking out on camera, knowing where it would lead. Uh, you are in for something of a storm as a result of, of doing this, and it will be difficult, it will be painful, but there is light at the other side, I can tell you. Um, and there is a lot to be gained from rebuilding afterwards um, a life where you're surrounded by people who love you unconditionally for who you are. And I think that uh, your brother would have wanted that for you because he certainly never had it himself, did he? Or at least not no. completely. Not, no. Yes, I completely agree. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Hopefully we can get you back on the channel at some point. It would certainly be interesting to know what the backlash is. So maybe we can uh, pick up the pieces uh, later on at some point. But thank you so much for sharing what you've shared. Thank you. So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I found it absolutely fascinating. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.